This is the Grand Valley Diversion Dam. Built in the early 1900s, it is located on the Colorado River in Debec Canyon, just north of Palisade, Colorado. This dam has quite a history. Let me tell you about it. Robert Thomas Williamson of Palisade, Colorado, located northeast of Grand Junction on the far west side of the state, was a strapping young man when he joined 100 other men in 1912 to work on the Grand Valley Water Project, a Bureau of Reclamation endeavor. Robert was handy with tools and could build just about anything. His youthful energy and skills helped complete the Valley's most impressive project to date. The project, located on the Colorado River, would eventually entail the completion of the Grand Valley Diversion Dam, locally referred to as the Roller Dam, with a 14-foot high, 546-foot long concrete diversion wear. A barrier across the river designed to alter its flow characteristics prevent flooding, measure discharge, and help render the river navigable. The Grand Valley Diversion Dam has three tunnels and five canals that stretch over 90 miles through the region. It is the largest of four such dams in the United States. Workers came from all walks of life, many with families and sweethearts. Robert Williamson, who was of Irish heritage, and the pretty Mabel McKay, whose father was the Palisade Marshal, fell in love shortly after the project began. Mabel and her father often made the long wagon or buckboard trip along the river to bring Robert a basket lunch. When the area was first settled, it certainly did not look like it does now. Instead of trees, grass, and flowers, there was sagebrush, greasewood, and desert. Without the advent of the irrigation systems we use today, including the diversion dam, the Grand Valley would likely have a very different portrait. Some of the original people that came here had a very negative view of this valley. That's why would anybody stop here? But the area around the airport, I think, is a very good feel uh, for what it would have been, and the area between Grand Junction and Delta, um, crossing the desert. But, you know, the early accounts that I've seen were greasewood and sagebrush and uh, just shale desert. Oh, my dad was there for 33 years. I lived there from the time I was a year and a half old until I went off to college. That was your irrigation for the entire valley. Through the war, of course, we had guard duty on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because if anything would have happened there, there would have been no irrigation for the lower valley. It's hard to imagine or picture without the diversion dam or had they not ever put in the laterals or the canal systems, it would be a, just a sagebrush desert, undoubtedly, still. If you don't have the water, you, you don't, you're not going to raise anything, whether it's a lawn for the homes or, or for fruit or vegetables or hay or whatever. Without water, there's no, it's, it's a start of almost life. You figure that the roller dam is what provides water for all the Palisade peaches. I mean, without the roller dam, there would be no Palisade peaches. Um, because it supplies the canals that uh, the government highline canal supplies the the price and the stub and the orchard mesa canals which is where the peaches grow and we have a flourishing valley with a fruit industry that is known worldwide for amazing palisade peaches and it can all be attributed to the diversion dam Irrigation has been a central and necessary feature of agriculture for over 5,000 years for many ancient civilizations. The first successful efforts to control the flow of water for use with irrigation were made in Mesopotamia and Egypt, where to this day, the remains of prehistoric irrigation works still exist. The development of irrigation systems, especially in Mesopotamia, was one of the major paths toward civilization and modernization. The irrigation systems in Mesopotamia had some major components like canals, gated ditches, and levees also gated. 
Irrigation was the primary basis of the economy. In ancient Egypt, the construction of canals was a major endeavor of the pharaohs, their servants, and the general population. The land was checkerboarded with small basins defined by a system of dikes. Problems regarding the uncertainty of the flow of the Nile were recognized and addressed. During very high flows, the dikes were washed away and villages flooded, drowning thousands. During low flows, the land did not receive enough water and crops could not grow. In many places where fields were too high to receive water from the canals, water was drawn from the canals or the Nile directly by a swape or a shadoof or well pole. The shadoof consisted of a bucket on the end of a cord or rope that hung from the long end of a pivoted boom pole and was then counterweighted. At the long end of this pole hangs a bucket bag or a bit human, a coated reed basket to scoop up and move water. Over thousands of years, irrigation techniques have been modified and adapted based on need, water availability, and diversity of its usage. The Assyrians also developed extensive public works. Sargon's son, Senak Urub, developed waterworks by damming the Tabitu River and using a canal to bring water to Nineveh, where the water could be used for irrigation without hoisting devices. For each civilization, these irrigation systems have played a major role in the evolution and development of numerous villages and cities in arid and semi-arid environments. Those ancient climates and the need for irrigation were much like that of the vast land area of the Grand Valley of Western Colorado. To exist and prosper, the Grand Valley of Western Colorado must have proper irrigation. The first irrigation canal, the Grand Valley Canal, was built in 1883. It is south of Palisade and diverts water by gravity from the river. As early as 1887, engineers envisioned a highline route for the most promising agricultural land, which included Palisade and land above the Grand Valley Canal. Another option was pumping water from the river, though that proved to be expensive and unreliable. A number of pumping projects, including the Smith and Struthers, Price and Stub ditches, simply failed it was clear that one all-encompassing irrigation system was needed. The United States Reclamation chose a site eight miles northeast of Palisade in Debec Canyon on what was then called the Grand River. The Grand Valley Project was one of the first of six projects activated by the Reclamation Act of June 17, 1902, which created the forerunner of the Bureau of Reclamation. Work began in September 1902 and concluded the flow of water was sufficient to supply 2,000 acre feet of water during the irrigation season. It was not practical to extend the system more than 50 miles to the Utah border, as some had envisioned. In 1903, a Grand Junction group proposed using private financing for the project. Not wanting to interfere with private enterprise, the Reclamation Service stopped work. The project was delayed for a decade for a number of reasons, which forced many fruit growers to haul barrels of river water on horse-drawn wagons to irrigate new land. On December 31, 1910, the following headline appeared in the Palisade Tribune newspaper. President Taft recommends High Line be built. With President Taft's support, the project was able to move forward. Finally, on September 23, 1912, Secretary of the Interior Walter Fisher gave the Reclamation Service authorization to begin construction. On October 12, 1912, construction of Tunnel No. 1 began. At the construction site, a sluiceway was established to divert the river while the dam was being built. The dam was built between 1912 and 1915 as part of the Grand Valley Project and diverts water into the government Highline Canal 
for a full irrigation of 33,368 acres and a supplemental irrigation to 8,600 acres in western Colorado's Grand Valley. The unique roller crest design was chosen because of the proximity of the Denver and Rio Grande railroad tracks already in place on the west side of Quebec Canyon. Unlike a conventional dam, it was necessary to construct a dam that would maintain the water level at approximately the same elevation during both high and low water situations. As part of the railroad's agreement, the project was required to raise the railroad tracks five feet higher without interrupting train service. Greek railroad employees used jacks to elevate the track and spread 19,725 cubic feet of canal excavation dirt beneath the tracks for 17,200 feet in the narrow canyon. At the time, the German firm Maschinenfabrik Augsburg Nuremberg AG held the patents for the roller crest design. The majority of other roller crest dams were used for power, not agriculture. But given the needs of the valley and to prevent flooding the railroad tracks, this design seemed to be the best choice. Another setback was the outbreak of World War I. This made it impossible for the German firm to complete the contract. The engineers scrambled to find an alternative source in the Ritter Conley Manufacturing Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They were able to manufacture the rollers using the same design. As much of the work on the dam and canals was completed before the rollers arrived. The Grand Valley Diversion Dam has six 70-foot-long rollers, just over seven feet in diameter. The rift structures are towers which contain machines to raise and lower the rollers. The level of water behind the dam is controlled by the position of the cylinders, or rollers, hence the roller dam. The rollers are raised and lowered in any combination necessary to maintain the proper water level regardless of the rate of flow of the river. A seventh roller, 60 feet long added to the west end, made the dam the largest roller crest dam in the world at the time. Building a dam was dangerous work. Temporary bridges spanned the river and workers balanced precariously on them. As a safety precaution, a manned boat waited downriver just in case anyone fell into the swift water. Fortunately, only one man fell, but he was able to grab a rope and pull himself back up. His hat, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. It made the wild trip downriver, but was saved by the boatman. The worst accident happened on August 31, 1913 when a rock fell from the roof of tunnel number one and struck James Pappas. It broke his back and he never recovered. Three more serious accidents occurred when the tunnels were being bored. Earthwork for the Highline Canal began in June 1913. The conditions of the contract led to Reynolds Ely Construction Company of Utah prohibited foreigners, convicts, and Mongolian labor on the project. Once completed, the Highline Canal stretched 55 miles and could carry 1,675 feet of water per second. The first water flowed through the Highline Canal on June 29, 1915. In 1907, another dam was constructed on the Gunnison River to provide water for the Redlands Mesa Power Canal. In 1917, this canal also provided water to 3,800 acres of land on Redlands Mesa. The land was soon changed. Fruit orchards and agriculture flourished. Palisade became world famous for its delicious peaches. Like a miracle, the water created by the roller dam along with many newly dug canals, quickly transformed the desert landscape, causing the area to blossom like a rose. By 
By the end of 1917, America entered World War I. Spanish influenza was wiping out millions around the globe. Western Colorado lost nearly one-third of its population. By then, Robert and Mabel had married, and the entire irrigation system was completed. During World War II, the roller dam was considered valuable enough to be guarded around the clock. The guard working the midnight shift wore black clothes and rubbed a shoe black on his 44 caliber revolver so it wouldn't reflect light from the river. The dam and its works remained in the Bureau of Reclamation's charge until 1949, when the Grand Valley Water Users Association took over. On March 8, 1950, over 450 feet of Tunnel No. 3 collapsed. The new tunnel was holed through on April 4, 24 days ahead of schedule thanks to the efforts of U.S. Congressman Wayne Aspinall from Palisade. Water was delivered to the High Line on May 4, just in time to save the valley's fruit trees and other crops from disaster. To this day, a caretaker lives on site to keep the still operating dam in working order. In October 1991, the Grand Valley Diversion Dam was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. We hope that this proud and well-deserved designation guarantees that the Grand Valley Diversion Dam will be around for another hundred years.